Our theme for today is impossible walls. Impossible walls, right there in Joshua chapter 6. And again, in a lighter way to think about this walk, I'm just going to get us thinking about any kind of a walk or a run or a race, whether it's just a fun run or fun walk or maybe a more intense kind of race you've been in. Um, anybody ever participated in one of those kind of cool things, like a fun run, 5K, 10K, 1K, <laughs> kids run, <laughs> All right? All right. What was the most memorable one that you've been in? I'll, I'll get to Josh here in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> anybody been in a... Yeah. Uh, bridge pedal. Bridge pedal. Okay, cool. Yeah. Going from bridge to bridge and port, all the bridges? Bridge. Wow. How many miles was that? TV. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, tired butt. Right. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, I want to only raise some memorables. 5K of the EW Eau Claire homecoming. Oh. And I was the last person to come in the AF finish. Nice. 5K, University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. Freshman year in college. Freshman year in college. <laughs> Great memory. All right. Yeah. John, you're a racer. So you're hot and miserable, and, they're, and you're trying, and they're scolding you? Yes. And you should go faster? I, I probably deserve it because I almost dropped out, and it was really bad. Some people did. Almost dropped out. Good, she, good analogy. All right. She, it turned out she was actually a race director of another race that I really enjoyed. Uh-huh. It's all about the coffee mug and the perks at the end of the race, right? Okay, so just that reminder in any kind of race and the mental game is a big deal because, yeah, if your head's not in it, especially for these longer ones, yeah. Race for the cure. the cure. First aid station, so you're helping with it, and a lot of people got hurt. Okay, yeah, totally. Uh, race at school. Race what? A lot of kids at school all the time. It's all about the race. Okay. Um, I'm going to show a couple pictures, then I'll get to Josh here. So here's a couple pictures I was recently out there. The Smith brothers were all racing at, uh, out in Estacada at McIver Park, and that was kind of fun to see you guys race with uh, Horizon. I think we've got another picture there. Yeah, there's some, so Smith brothers and friends. There you go. There's Derek. And then I also met up with a friend of mine from high school who was coaching. That was kind of cool, a blast from the past. Uh, we weren't running. That's, those days are gone. <laughs> Well, no, not really. They shouldn't be gone. i got to get inspired by people like Josh. So um, I don't have a picture. I should have stole one off of Facebook from you or asked you for one. But Josh Douglas just ran a mar- the Portland Marathon. So good job. He finished. Woo! But what was something you learned or what was the significance of it for you or what's something you learned, Josh? A lot of training. So I had to strip away a lot of expectations, too, um, because I just didn't know and I felt like I needed to have certain expectations or I needed to run a certain pace. Okay. Um, so you had certain expectations that gradually shifted as you went through. Right. So it's not you weren't going to win, you didn't think, after, yeah. after a while? <laughs>
Just follow the regimen that you had to have. You knew that it had to be many months out starting to training too, right? Fiftieth anniversary of the marathon. So you ran on that fiftieth marathon. Wow. Yeah, so there was about six thousand runners between the uh, Okay, wait a minute. How many? About six thousand six thousand runners. Yeah. So you're like walking the start, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean you had to you had to line up based on where you felt your pace was. And so you know, they started mm. And a prize number, people had to drop out even because maybe they just either got injured or maybe they just didn't train to the finish. Yeah. Right. So my goal was, you know, obviously just to finish. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they have a little app where people could watch you uh, throughout the race. And the kids, I took an Uber down there because there wasn't going to be any parking. Yeah, you got down there at like 4 a.m. and then... Yeah, I got to go <laughs> five. Uh, I didn't uh, then, but they met up with, those guys met up with you at the end, right? Right. So, you know, I got little messages, you know, through my, you know, earpiece along the way from the kids. Mm-hmm. Saying, oh, Dad, can make it up here. Oh, good. Here so, story. encouragement <laughs> was a big deal. But I didn't know they made it down there. You know, mm-hmm. Hitting the wall. You know, it's been a lot. I was starting to hit the wall. I didn't know. I grabbed a cup of water. I didn't know. I started back up. And, uh, um, and then I totally sent a message to my app. It's a dead over the finish line. We're waiting for you. Oh, a great shot. Yeah. Wow. And that's, wow. That's what I needed to get. That gave, it, that gave you that final push. Way to go, Tully. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Brought you down on your knees, huh? So if you didn't hear that, uh, Tully gave Josh the last encouragement that he needed through his little earpiece, saying, you can do it, Dad, almost there, and then tackled him at the finish line. <laughs> gave football tackle. Well, congrats. And uh, any other marathon veterans? Has anybody else ever that ran or walked a marathon, like on a race, a regular race, not just anybody else? Oh, Julie? Nice. Okay, so we got two marathon vets in here. Okay. Well, congratulations. And I, I wanted to open with this. Thanks for sharing that story, too. Um, as we look at Joshua 6 here in a moment, think about what they've done. They've been on this really 40 year walk, only kind of in circles through the wilderness, finally entering in the promised land. And. Leader, leadership has been transferred from Moses to Joshua. Um, last week, chapter 5, as the people were going to look out at the city and maybe find a plan of attack, how to take over Jericho, these thick, high walls. And if you remember, at the end of that passage, Joshua met the commander of the Lord's army, practically like God himself. And he worshipped there. He worshipped the Lord and recognized I think essentially his need, God had to lead this. It wasn't him that was going to do this. And his smarts and his you know, military strategy, it was God. And so he's been reminded again, God is leading the people. He's the one leading and winning their battles. It's not about Joshua. It's not about us, right? God's leading this charge. Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. And he, Joshua obeys And, you know, as you think about this story, a lot of us kind of bring Joshua and the story of the walls of Jericho down to the little kid's song. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And it's just kind of this cute sing-song little story that almost becomes like a fable. But, no, this is what God did. This was the scenario, the situation that was that was heavy, that was like, how is this going to happen? How can we trust by doing this? We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, much grittier than you may have thought before. And I want us to listen kind of with fresh eyes and ears as we read once again. And uh, Tyler Selke, I've got one of our uh, young men here at church, is going to read the Bible reading. Come on up, Tyler. He's going to read from Joshua 6. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Joshua 6. We're going to read from verses, start out. Tyler's going to lead us off in verses 1 through 11. 
And uh, thank you, Tyler. All right. There you go. Thanks for reading. Yeah. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carried the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests, who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All, the t all this time the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had, com had commanded the people, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to. Shout, then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, then the people returned to the camp and spent the night there. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks for reading. Great job. So that's the start. That's the beginning of this whole uh, seven-day uh, walk uh, around the city. Um, and I want you to think about uh, these verses. We see this plan from God to Joshua in the first major test. Uh, and it, I made other tests, of course, crossing the river and seeing how God provided in that way. But this was like the, a real big military conflict now, a test of faith. And were Joshua and the others going to be skeptical of God's plan? Were they going to believe in it and follow through with it? And we see Joshua responded with faith, and he followed the specific detailed instructions from God. And I think as we talked about even last week, Joshua was kind of gaining in confidence, um, obeying the Lord. You know, again, he'd gotten them through so many of these interesting and um, impossible situations, even crossing the Jordan River, where the Jordan, you know, the, the river was parted so they could go across. And he's asked to take the city, and he's responding in faith. And God says, I have this for you. The city is in your hands. I have done this. I will do this, God says. And listen and obey, even if it seems like, I mean, in a human perspective, let's honestly say to the people and to us, this is kind of a ridiculous plan. This doesn't sound like military, you know, commanders would like, okay, this is the strategic way we're going to take over the city of Jericho. But, okay, again, okay, God had done these things before. Uh, following, we follow these specific detailed instructions and we do this procession with the, the warriors and soldiers and the priests carrying it out in front, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, several hundred thousand Israelites, all these people. And, you know, it's like, okay, could I follow this plan that God would give me? Walk around and then yell and blow horns. <laughs> all right? I mean, think about it. Uh, would I just say, yeah, okay, God, this makes sense. Let's go. Or, uh... And it sometimes reminds us, as we think about God's word and some of the simple, direct commands of God's word, uh, please, from God, and how many times do we overcomplicate things that God says to do that are, oh, this is too simple, or this is outdated. Your word, oh, I know a whole lot better than you do, God. Let me bring my modern day uh, experience and knowledge well, what did Jesus say? In John 14, 15, he said, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. Trust and obey. Obey what I command. 
And now we get to the passage where Jericho is conquered, and I'm going to read from verses 12 through 21 now. As uh, we see Joshua, that's uh, so one time they've been around it already. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city uh, seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, shout. No, let's see, exclamation point. Shout! <laughs> For the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared. Because, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when, all, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord, destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And we'll pause here now. So, again, there's this procession. If you remember in the, just the verses earlier around verse 10, and the, the first six days, they weren't supposed to do any taunting or yelling at the wall, people in Jericho that were maybe watching them and even wondering what they were going to do, ready to fire on them with their arrows. They just keep silent marching those six days and then even those the seventh day and God told them to destroy everything except keep these precious metals for worship and again skepticism going through these days what's going to happen but uh, all these all these miraculous things and ways they they followed in obedience are building I think even that crossing of the Jordan okay he, God did this God's going to do this too but it still seems like a crazy plan that they move forward in obedience. And I think God is telling the people, listen, this isn't about you. It's not about what you do here to conquer the city. It's about what I will do. Obey God. Do it his way. Don't just trust in your own strength and wisdom. Uh, I, you know, I am the one who is directing this. And I don't know. Out there, as I speak with you, uh, uh, how many of you would say, you know, I'm just kind of a doer. I like to take action and accomplish stuff. How many of you would you say, that's kind of my makeup. I like to make a plan and do it, okay? You know, if you're, uh, you know, kind of like that engineer mode. Uh, Sarah, my wife Sarah, her, her dad is an engineer, and he was like, all right, he would accomplish to do something, to build something, whether at home or at work. Okay, we get this done, right? Okay, you can kind of like... And even to have some good pride in that, no, I, I, I see a plan, I want to get it done, I make it happen. And so I think even these people in Israel, you might, you might have had some people that were, had some special skills, maybe even some special forces, some of these mighty men that were helping lead the charge. And uh, Joshua says, hey, don't touch your sword, don't talk, don't yell. And these guys are saying, wait a minute, we've been training, <laughs> we're ready. No, you need to obey God and do it his way. And, and sometimes that kind of faith and trust is hard for us, not trusting in our own strength or wisdom. And um, I don't know, do we ever rob God of his glory by inserting ourselves into a situation, doing what we think is right, because we don't believe God's plan is just right. Well, God, I don't know if you got this. I got to take matters into my own hands. Okay, and we see this plan unfolding. Uh, as you look more closely in some of these I think somewhat troubling verses, many would say, you know, 17 through 21, uh, where God says, hey, burn everything, everything living, destroy. 
And don't take any of these spoils of war either. Oh, that looks good. I'd like to have that in my home. That's a nice item and that looks kind of cool. If you take any of these things, other than what I've said, the silver, gold, precious metals for the, the treasury of the, of the, for worship, if you take any of these things, condemnation will come on you. And a little spoiler alert to the next chapter, there were some people that didn't do what God said. And we'll visit that next week. Let's just say it didn't go so well for them. And we ask these questions, you know, you think, why, God, why would you be so ruthless in just destroying people like this? And don't forget, Jericho was a very, very, let's add one more very, wicked city. And God could not let his people be influenced in one degree by this horrible culture. Everything and everyone had to be destroyed. There was sexual immorality, there was child sacrifice, and there's other secular writings that attest to this about this culture in this day of Jericho. And God didn't and couldn't have his people influenced by this horrible culture. And this is the first test of faith, right? Glory to God, not to you. I'm the one who got you in here, who conquered this city, God says, and obey, listen. And, you know, he brings them alongside. He's using them still to, you know, to do his work. Uh, but listen to me. Obey what I'm doing, uh, what I'm saying. And they didn't complain. And they did. Well, we'll see next week. I guess there was an exception. But they did what God told them to do. And they walked and did those circling the city. And, and it wasn't their might and swords and, you know, uh, themselves. It was what God was doing. And entered in as they encircled the walls and did what God said, raised that shout, that last time, that seventh time on that seventh day, and the walls came down. And God conquered this city for his people. And, you know, scripture after scripture reminds us of these words and what God did. Uh, I know a, a timeless verse I'd like us to read together that's from Proverbs 3. I'd like us to read, and there's other verses I put in your outline too that you might want to read, but let's read this these verses from Proverbs together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. And I think we quote Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 often, <laughs> but do you see that verse 7? Right? Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't try to take all matters into your own hands. Fear the Lord. And then what they had to do here in, in removing all these detestable practices and items that were in Jericho, shun evil. As we move further into this, we do see God's mercy and grace in these next verses. And I'll read 22 through 27. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out on the land, Go into, go into the prostitute Rahab's house and bring her out uh, and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her that you recall from a few chapters ago. So the young men who had done the spying uh, went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire fam family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab and her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies in Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son will he lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Let's talk about Rahab here for a moment, because she is one who was vital to the Israelites, to the spies. She hid them in her home, and ultimately we see, I think we pointed this out a couple weeks ago, she's even seen now in the lineage of King David and the line of Christ, of Jesus Christ. If you look to Matthew 1, verse 5. 
So these two who spied out the land were told to bring out Rahab, father, mother, brothers, all the relatives, and then the rest of the destruction happened. And how are they going to come in and identify her? You remember, she kept her promise that they told her to keep and kept that scarlet cord hanging out the window, and she was saved and spared. And ultimately, we see Rahab now initially put outside the camp. What do we do with this outsider? But she was welcomed into the people of Israel. She marries. She has children. Great, great, great grandmother of Jesus. I'm not sure how many greats it was, but <laughs> there's a lot. And she's in the line of Jesus. We see later in Hebrews that it was her faith that saved her that made her righteous. And from Hebrews 11:31. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So yes, we see God's righteous and holy anger towards his enemies, but his grace and mercy to those who would believe. Even in the city of Jericho, sounds like there, could, there was opportunity. Do you want to believe in this God or not? Well, Rahab did. Her life was spared. Interestingly enough, just anecdotally in verse 26 where it says, cursed before the Lord is the one who rebuilds the city. About 400 years later, they tried to rebuild the city. Not a good idea. And literally that promise was sadly fulfilled for the builder and the family and the death that was upon him. And the crumbled walls were to be left as a remembrance. God's city and finally, at the end of this chapter, we see Joshua again, his, his confidence, not just in himself, but I believe his confidence in God was growing. The Lord was with Joshua, it says. His fame spread throughout the land. He's listening, he's obeying, right where God wants him to be, stepping out in faith and obedience. We see Scripture interpreting Scripture, and we see Old Testament promises fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And um, I believe that the promises we have in Jesus are throughout even this story. You know, you think about even the way that God sets up this procession. The Ark of the Covenant is right in the middle of this procession. And we see the presence of God as we're going to celebrate communion in a moment. The presence of Jesus is right in the midst of, of his people. And, uh, you know, interesting, again, we see how uh, uh, th these reminders in Scripture uh, of what God has done, even in, as Rahab's rescue was made. Uh, in Ephesians 2, verse 13, it says, But now you've been united with Christ. Once, as Rahab was, you were far away from God, but now you have brought near, you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. All these parallels in Scripture of what God has done. Um, one other just, I think, interesting parallel to think about, you know, you think about that final shout, okay, so they'd gone, circled the city several times, that final, that seventh time, make that circle of the city, and then cry out, and, and then the wall came down, but think about Jesus' final cry from the cross, it is finished, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, kind of like those walls coming down, right? And, or Jesus on the cross, when, when he was on the cross, he didn't, he didn't taunt his enemies. What did he do? He said, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And even as the people were instructed, as they walked the city, they could have gotten built up confidence and said, hey, you know, look out. You're, these walls are going to come down in a few more days, and you better. They just did what God told them to do, circling that city. And as we see that example of Jesus, even in his ministry, even up to the cross, walked among the people. He's central, centering our lives on him as we move forward in faith. And so this, this story is much more than a, you know, a, a children's fable, more than in a specific event. It's God's people responding in faith. And no matter what walls there may be, there's no, there's no wall so great that God can overcome, can't overcome. It's about God doing his thing in his way, faith and obedience. And even the walls that we think of, of faith, I think about the highest wall of just people that are contrary to the gospel and seeing example after example of people that well, that wall comes down and they, 
they come to Christ. I read a devotional this morning about that. A man who was a drug dealer who said, basically said to God, read some, some, heard some story or read some scripture or a, a, maybe some a preacher he heard. And, and he said, and he's this hardcore drug dealer, and he goes, I dare you, Jesus, to come into my life. <laughs> he did. And his life has never been the same. That's what God does. And think of other walls, you know, whether it's a broken marriage, debt, depression, physical ailments. Do you ever feel like there's impossible walls in your life, in your family? Things that only God can do, only God can break down. We're going through a, a, just a six-week Bible study. We've still got a couple more weeks of it left. It's called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at the Table. And that's what the enemy wants to do, is to say, yeah, that wall's too big. That wall can never come down. You're not, you're not going to be able to overcome that. God can't help you. And the reminder from Psalm 23 is, no, don't give the enemy a seat at your table. I'm going to show you just a short one-minute clip of this video in a moment. And I want you to think about that as you think about any walls that are up that seem insurmountable in your life. Trusting in God, trusting in Jesus, following him, Faith and obedience. That's all we have to offer. It's God. It's Jesus that does the rest. So let's watch this short clip. This nine-word title, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table, that message came to me at a very difficult time in my life and changed the narrative, changed my focus. God has prepared this table before me in the presence of my enemies, but I have responsibility for that table, and through Christ, through His grace, through His power, I have the ability to manage whose voices are at that table. You and I were created by God, and we were created for God. What that means is every one of us was created innately to be led, and to be led by the God who made us. So if we choose not to let God lead us, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be led. It just means that we're going to let something else have the influence, the leadership, the determining voice in our lives. And so I know the message has power because I've experienced that power. And I'm honored to be able to step into your world and to maybe be a voice for God into your story that that same power can set you free. So I love that word. What are you going to be led by? Right? You're going to be led by something. Somebody's voice. I don't know about you, but I want to follow God's voice to the place where there is life and there is hope. And we've got two more sessions on Wednesday nights, and you're going to get some encouragement to, to hear that and to remember that. Uh, God's invitation always stands. This is the one for this Wednesday. Or, and then the last one, it's going to be in the presence of my enemies, even when there's evil and enemies all around me. Hear that voice. Hear God's voice. And we're focusing on Psalm 23. So I encourage you. These last two Wednesdays are going to be powerful if you want to join us at 630 for that uh, about hour-long Bible study. So that's one way to apply, thinking again, hearing those voices, trusting in God, not trusting in the other things around us or our own schemes and plans that seem so much better. But to pray about uh, today, is there a wall in your life that seems too big to overcome? Will you follow God's way even when the situation looks impossible or impractical? And then if you're dealing with impossible things today, remember you're not alone. Listen to God, obey Him, step out in faith, and choose to hear His voice above all others.